Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the Choker Bros. I'm your host, Samson Knight Prime. Before I get started, I want to thank our sponsor, Cars of Evilise. Um, if you're looking to uh, purchase your foils or singles, you can buy this entire deck um, probably for just around this price, foil low price of 130 um, and non-foil for 87 That is drastically cheaper than most uh, decks. Um, and if you have some of the piece core pieces already, like Shantoto and Minwoo, you're already in a good spot. Now... There is a reason that this deck is so cheap, and a lot of it is because some of a lot of these cards aren't seeing that much play. Um, I am a fan of the Water Earth archetype. I played it first in the Summoner series back in Orlando, where I split the finals, um, and then I also played it in the Petit Cup uh, to a first place finish in Kansas last year. Uh, so I am really familiar with the archetype. I like it a lot. It's probably my first or second favorite archetype in Final Fantasy TCG. So I'll give you a little bit of insight into the card choices uh, as best as I can. A lot of my stuff is just kind of uh, off the whim of what I think will be good, what I think will become relevant, um, and what, are, what I think that will be good choices for a particular event. Now, um, I'm going to try to answer a lot of questions that were asked. I had a lot of people PMing me questions as far as uh, why this card, why that card. Um, what do you do in this matchup? What against? What about this opponent? How did this matchup go? So, I will do my best to remember and uh, give you as detailed as a report. Uh, real fast, I will go over the matchups. Uh, round one was was versus Austin uh, Archer, and I believe he was on Ice Earth. Um, and the notable card in that matchup was Cloud of Darkness, which wiped five of his forwards at once, and there was really no comeback from that. Um, Ice Earth can be a tough matchup, particularly if they land in early Sephiroth. Uh, but other than that, I feel pretty comfortable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, while I was saying that, I was thinking if there's a matchup I don't necessarily feel comfortable with, and, and there is, and I'll get to that. Um, round two, I was with uh, Ethan, and Ethan was a one of my opponents who had also played uh, the same deck versus the same deck in the tournament the night before as the warm-up tournament. And Ethan was on a fire, or earth wind, uh, f like the fire Euranger mill deck. Uh, with Phoenixes. Um, the notable difference between him and my top eight opponent, Steven, was uh, that Ethan was running Paul's, uh, and Paul is probably the scariest card in the matchup, and perhaps the scariest card that this deck could face other than uh, Sin and possibly Astola. Those three cards are kind of a nightmare, Astola, Sin, and Paul. Put them all in one uh, deck, and you probably have a, a winning combination to beat this deck, but I don't know how well you'll do against the rest of the field. Um, but, you know, he, he was on the back foot quite a, quite a ways in our matchup. Uh, at one point he needed to Cleone, or he had to sack his Estrella to, uh, the tr to break the Cleone trigger so he could, um, Hecaton my Minwoo, only for me to have a minor in hand, Min Minwoo get it back, play it again. It was just an uphill battle. Uh, round three, I played against Ian Velez, um, my, uh, Cohort and, and and good friend from here in Tampa and arch enemy from Petite Cups as uh, I lost to him in the top four. The last one he lost to me in this top four, um, which we'll get to. But uh, our round three match really came down to me adapting to the matchup where I had learned a lot about it playing him uh, in those three rounds at the RVA or I mean, at the reunion event. Sorry. Um, and so this is my fourth time playing against a deck he doesn't typically play in locals, and I had never played this in locals. Um, so it was really about adapting, and I, I think I adapted pretty well. Um, and, I, and I built the deck so that it wouldn't lose to that type of ping damage. Um, although it does have a sort of weakness to the Stadion, which he hit into damage during our Swiss game. So I was Ian's only loss. And I'm going into round four at 3-0 when I come against uh, John Schreiner, who... Um, he is playing the sweet uh, Prince deck that uh, those guys up there uh, came up with. Um, and it was a close match. I think that I'm pretty favored if I play a little bit better. I didn't play my best. I think John made a few mistakes. I made a few mistakes as well. Um, and what it ended up coming down to is he's dead on board um, if I have one more turn. But unfortunately, he's able to have a summon in his hand. And he plays really well to not kill my gal. That's for me to knock it out of his hand. Um, and he's able to break my Cleone, causing me to actually go down to one card and deck out before I can kill him. So now I'm at X1 and I'm against Colin Rupert. I'm catching no breaks in this tournament. Uh, similarly, we have a, a game in which I think I described it in the podcast. So um, in, in the normal podcast with, with uh, Zach and Cody. So Zach and Cody. 
Is that the name of like a, a Disney show? I have never noticed that before now. Anyway, um, with Zack and Cody, um, but it was a really great match, really close. Then round six, I'm at X and two. This is where I have to pray for tiebreakers and continue to win. But luckily, my strength of schedule is great because I am paired against Mohammed, um, or you know, as as you guys mostly know, Mohammed um, Zaim is what I call him. Um, but Zaim is playing Wind Water and typ typical deck, uh, your typical Wind Water uh, Yuri deck. He decides to uh, open with turn one Shinra, goes and gets his Yuna. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to set up, I'm going to set up, it's going to be pretty safe. Uh, and I discard my Viking, um, play backup, and then he Zidane's me, um, and he's able to take the Layla out of my hand. Next turn, I, you know, I, like a master, I just top deck like a Minwoo and a Layla. So set up this really great combination. Uh, three or four turns later, I play a... Gao into Cleone and he goes to kind of try to clear it with a Valfor and another Valfor and then this and that and this and that completely forgetting about the the Minwoo and thus securing me the match pretty easily because of that mistake so I'm going into the final round X and 2 pretty nervous um, and I'm paired against Vincent Shannon who is playing Jim Doodle's uh Moogle's deck, and if you guys haven't played against a deck, it's quite scary, particularly against a pilot who knows what they're doing. Um, up until this point, most of my opponents have been like Smiley. Vincent is locked in, very serious. Um, I could tell that he's probably nervous as well. <laughs> We're both looking at X2 bubble here, even if we win, it's possible we, we get bubbled. Um, we're at table number five, so anything could happen. I am able to beat him. Uh, I, there are a lot of cards that help me do that. Minwoo obviously is very good against that deck. Um, Zagnol's being huge. Cloud of Darkness coming in and clearing his board. Just a, a lot of really long, grindy uh, plays that I never really felt behind. I never really felt safe either. It was constantly back and forth. Um, I think he hit me to four. I hit him to four. Hit me to five. Hit him to five, and so on. And I was able to bar barely squeak that one out. Now um, uh, I sweat. Make top eight, very lucky. Play against Steven Arboleta, even luckier because it's probably my easiest matchup despite um, Earth, Earth, Wind, uh, Euranger being one of the best decks, if not, in my opinion, the top two or top three best decks in the format. Um, it's a very, very good matchup where you can just sit on Cleon and kind of wait them out. Um, and that's exactly what I did game one. I was able to Ozma special I think once that game and, and twice a second game. Um, I did have a lot of people ask me about um, Steven playing a uh, wall with just WinCP, and I think that it was just an accident. Those things happen. We are both tired, uh, nervous, ready for the day to get over, so I don't think there's any malicious intent there. Um, those things just happen when you get tired. I don't think it was malicious. Um, our games were good. Steven played to the best of his ability. He played to his outs. Um, I think there was a time where he overcommitted into the second Osmo special, but I think in all fairness, fairness, he's thinking like, well, I have to punish him before he draws it probably, but if he has it, he has it, and I did have it. So I took that and moved into the semifinals against Ian yet again. I'm not excited to play against Ian in the semifinals. Ian is very, very good, one of the best players in our local scene. Uh, we trained quite a bit together. like. You know, Dragon Ball Z style um, chamber. Like we're we're in it, all right. Um, he's playing the same deck, obviously from the reunion. Uh, I beat him in Swiss. So I'm feeling good about that. Uh, game one, I kind of used that to my my knowledge of the match to my advantage. It was a closer game, but I was able to win. Game two was an extremely close game, um, but I drew very awkwardly and couldn't set up my Earth backups. And ended up costing me the match where I just, uh, I think I actually ended up conceding out of going to have to deck out anyway. I, I don't exactly remember, I have to watch the, the VOD, but I knew I was dead when I realized that all three of my Kefkas I had to have discarded to um, activate my um, Calabrina. So, go to game three. Um, and game three, you know, probably the, the stream is watching and they're just like, what, what is he doing? I go turn one, Cleone, um, pass. And uh, I, I have no regrets about that. I was hoping to draw an Earth card because I had three Earth cards. Let's see, no, two. I had two Earth cards. I needed to draw 
two more to be able to play the Zagnol into the Minfilia and then activate the Zagnol and, uh, you know, play a min with min my hand. And so from there, it's just a really safe play. Um, the Zagnol is very good against this deck once you have Cleon and Minwu. Um, and I didn't draw the other card, but that was fine. I was totally fine with going turn one Cleon because the deck can function without backups pretty easily, particularly when decks want to be aggressive. Um, Ian's deck is much more controly, but can flip to the aggressive uh, side of things real quickly. Um, I think that Ian failed to do that and then also got very unlucky as I hit uh, the worst card in the game. Um, ugh, gross. I hit the Alua twice into the break zone, and then I also hit his Estanian, which is possibly the best card in his deck against my deck, um, into the break zone. So I kind of coasted through the last game pretty easily uh, with a little bit of luck. It was great. The finals, I did not play out. It was late. Um, you know, I, off I offered the split and offered to play for the trophy. Um, Hunter accepted the split, declined to play for the trophy. He was equally ready to go home, and we were about to be on our way. Uh, what ensued was like a 20-minute discussion of how to split the prizes equally, where we I think we both left very, very happy. Um, that being said, let me get into a little bit of deck analysis now that you've known how the tournament goes. We'll start with the Delita. Um, in the future, you could cut Delita if you wanted to, um, particularly if you think people will start to pick up Sin. Uh, delete it really is a flex spot used to handle Ishtola and handle the Emperor. Um, and there are there are a few other things that can pose um, an annoyance uh, that Delita is able to take care of. And, and you get free activations or free uses as a Delita basically by sacking your Layla Vikings. Sometimes even your Galdez is pretty good value. Certainly your, your Calbrina can be uh, a very big upset. There are certainly times uh, which you would... Uh, Activate Ozma, Ozma special, uh, and then, um, you know, follow it up to kill whatever they want with your Delita. And so, Delita was a good flex card. Not necessarily needs to stay or go. I would keep it, but, you know, if you want to cut it, I wouldn't fault you. Galdez, um, pretty good staple in the deck. I wasn't necessarily playing it, but I found that I, I did end up liking it quite a bit uh, at the, the advice of Kyle McGinty, along with uh, another card in this deck. Uh, he recommends sticking with the Galdez. It was pretty good for me over the tournament. It also wasn't great. Certainly, certainly would be in the uh, on the chopping block more than any of the other cards up here besides possibly Delita. Um, Layla Viking. I know a lot of people don't like them. I get it. You lose a lot of value if they vow for you. But it was an aggressive room, and I would not have changed playing Layla Viking. Nor would I change it in the future. I think it's important for the deck to be able to set up. By, by the deck some time. It, it's great with Hilda. Obviously, the only reason you're running uh, Braun, and then it's amazing with Kefka. So those cards I wouldn't necessarily cut, but we get to Gao. Gao is obviously a centerpiece of the deck. Some of the monster decks recently have been lowering him down to two or, you know, just, just trying to get value out of him. But this deck is so susceptible to like things like Ramu that I think that Cleon is very important and be able to, to play all your Cleons is absolutely of the, the most up, uh, importance and so gal while it's never huge like in the old monster decks like you're never getting like this 10k 11k gal um because a lot of your monsters are breaking you're breaking them with kafka cleon breaks by itself they're going to kill your zagnolis eventually um if your ozma lives for too long you've already won the game anyway so while it's not huge it does get you quite a bit of value and um the one thing i would say is i i occasionally felt like i didn't have enough to drop um Monsters in the deck, so we'll get to that. That's something I would possibly include some more of. Um, Cloud of Darkness. You could cut Cloud of Darkness to one, or you could up it to three. I wouldn't go down to zero. I wouldn't go down to zero, and I wouldn't stay at two. Um, I think that's important to have some sort of wrath on your board. I think that if people know the deck list and they know that the deck's playing two, then you can surprise them with a third. Or if they see the first one in your break zone, they could assume you're playing a second one and play around it, even though you're not, giving you a vital amount of time. Kefka, uh, I went back and forth between Dark Kefka, uh, this Kefka, or a mix of the two. I found this Kefka to be stronger um, in this particular field that I was I was playing in, particularly because I wanted to be able to handle things like Ishtola, um, which I thought were important. Um, careful to Kefka and to an Ishtola if you're breaking something like um, Calbrina or Cleone as it'd be very awkward if they stole your your 
trigger, so don't break those when trying to kill an Estrella. Those things are, you know, you can break them with other things. Um, but Kafka is great when you're breaking your Layla, Viking, Calvarina, Galdas, etc, etc, etc. Then, Cleone, the backbone of the deck, and the reason that you can run this deck, please do not try to run the deck without Cleones. Please do not try to run de monster decks without Cleones. I love the old Valfour deck more than anyone. It was my favorite deck. Uh, I played it for a long, long time. Um, and But, you know, with Ramal running around, you just can't, you can't risk it. A lot of the same reason we're not running what is possibly one of the best uh, monsters with the Green Dragon. Um, Bang a Thief is pretty good. Cobalt Droid Druid saw a lot of play before Valfour and certainly before Rima, so I wouldn't I wouldn't run those without Cleone, and I certainly might not even run those even with Cleone, as you can see. The monsters I'm running with Cleone sometimes aren't even something they want to take out. Like, they don't feel good about taking on a Zagmal because they don't respect the card quite enough early on before it becomes a forward, and by the time it does, you have a Cleone to protect it. Schrodingers are basically making this a 47 card deck. You could cut any number of them if you found better picks, but they are great to be able to get back things from your yard. I really like to be able to use them to um, get back Kefkas later, Gao specials. The best thing you could possibly get back is if you flip it back up and you get back the Ozma special, and they're easy to break with Kefka. I think I would keep them at three. I would literally play six if possible, but again, they're just to reduce the deck size, so you could actually just play less. Uh, Zagnol was insane. If you watched my matches, you saw I I killed I did more points of damage with Zagnol than probably any of the other fours absolutely combined. Um, although Ozma may have won me more games, Zagnol was the one putting in the damage and the work. Calbrina is one of the cards you could uh, take it or leave it. You could cut it. You could add a second one. It just depends on your your matches. I don't think that Earthwind can beat this card. Um, but it's not great in other matchups. So I like it at one. You can Schrodinger it back later, um, as well as getting it back with Galdez. Uh, it has some cute synergies with Delita and Kefka. All in all, it's a pretty good card, um, as you can tell if you watch some of my matches. Gigas is obviously uh, very, very good with with Momidi, um, because it costs zero. Now, I, if they printed 4K um, cards like Berserker, which were 9 CP, even if it could block, even if Berserker could block, I don't think it would see that much play. It might see more play, but the reason that Gigas sees play despite its offset is that zero ability really is important. The fact that it can't be uh, Shantoto, it can't be Cloud of Darkness, it can't be, you know, nothing during their turn can really affect it unless you choose to activate it. Um, and you get to play around the stuff when you're ready. You'll see times where I play Gigas on turn one, and I don't necessarily activate to block the first few points of damage. I, you know, not until I have a Cleone to be able to protect it or something along those lines. Or a Viking if I think they might have a fan for it. I would keep it at three or two at the least. Uh, three Ozma. This is Kyle McGinty's ad, and it was certainly the reason that I made Top Cut. <clears throat> Um, probably. I mean, my list before was pretty strong too, and it just had different a different alternate uh, win condition. Um, and o but Ozma was really good, and particularly good when I combined it with Momidi. Um, these two cards together, very very good attack. Um, and if they try to block, particularly when they're trying to block with something, they get free value out of something like a three CP pain, right? You're able to kill that and the rest of their board, whereas normally the special doesn't kill all that. And oftentimes I did activate Ozma during my opponent's turn to block. Uh, the backup line is where some of the criticism comes in. You didn't have enough two drop backups. So, okay, maybe, but let's count them. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, standard, what we'd call standard. Now, in Hansry, you have Layla Viking. You could also play Hilda. So it's fine, um, and I count Braun as 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 one be not because you know it costs the same as you know I know the searchers you, you could debate how much they cost whatever you want that's fine, but the value you get from it playing turn one is more important than just the search because it allows you to search up the Viking to put in your yard to fuel later for things like Layla. That is more important than paying one extra CP for a backup. And feeling bad about it you, you shouldn't feel bad about it it's fantastic if you play turn one summoner or turn one run you're gonna end in the turn with the exact same amount of cards in hand okay um, similar to Artemisian you're gonna end the same with the same amount of cards in hand although I guess with Artemisian quite a different number so speaking of which Artemisian you could certainly cut it it wasn't great the reason being I actually love every card in this deck the only card I ever wanted to put on bottom ever was a Hilda if it was early. Um, 
otherwise it felt bad mulliganing any of these cards basically to the bottom of your deck when you only have two searchers so keep that in mind that you can certainly cut artemisian or cut cut at least one of them summoner was fantastic absolutely amazing um, if you expect the mirror match or you expect a lot of Astrolas, I can see playing Green Mage. Uh, for this particular tournament, I knew it was an aggressive field. There's a lot of aggro in there, a lot of mono fire. There's a lot of Scions. And, you know, of course, we have Ian's deck. So, um, Summer was absolutely fantastic. I would not change it currently. We just talked about Brawn quite a bit. Uh, Menwu is matchup dependent, but obviously it's very, very good with cards like Zagnol, which are huge. Um, and, and can soak up a lot of damage. Oftentimes, Gao is, is pretty big and soak up damage. Uh, one thing to talk about with the next card, Mobody, it doesn't just have synergy with your Gigas, which is fantastic to hit with. Pretty decent with your Calabrina. Great with any type of 9k. Um, there are times where I Mobodied Vikings because I either wanted them to block to do something after combat um, that would finish off their guy, or I, I wanted to be able to just attack and then they, they, they saw the combat trick coming. For example, if they thought I might have the Osmo special, so I would um, just get in a free point of damage with Viking, and then I still have it on the block. So particularly, this is a pretty good card to get Brave when you're on the defense, and you think you can squeeze in a point of damage, but him dying necessarily wouldn't be the worst for you. Um, but even so, it's also great with Delita, as every time you give him Brave, Delita becomes an 8k. Really important to note that. Um, Miner is perhaps one of the best backups in the game, clearly. I don't play that many guys that I really want to get back. I just don't have the CP um, available often to spend the CP plus lose the Earth backup. I'm not really willing to do that. So I found one, um, just because I want another true drop that could get me back my Minwoos when they were Hecaton, and that happened quite a bit. Um, now, uh, I think that Minfilia is just better than Miner in this particular deck because I'm not running any summons. But I knew against like something like Turbo Ice, I was never going to be able to... Not Turbo Ice, because we don't have Turbo anymore. But the Ice Sephiroth decks, for example, that we weren't going to have the CP to be able to cast the Minfilia um, any later than turn 1 or 2 um, due to a lot of the discard effects. So I went into with the first Miner instead of the third Minfilia. That being said, Minfilia is insanely good with cards like... Uh, Zagnol. I guess I forgot to mention that Cloud of Darkness also triggers Zagnol, as does Hilda. The one of Hilda was excellent. I wouldn't blame you for cutting it. It is a risky card. It is a Johnny card. Um, but it was really good. And I could see it being really bad for some people. I wouldn't mind playing this deck at 16 back and just cutting this for something of value. Um, would be fine. Absolutely. Like an Adamant choice, for example, would be fine in the deck. Um, Talked about Minfilia, three Shantotos also turn on the the Zagnols. Um, the way you, it works is you can play the Cloud Darkness or the Shantoto and stack the triggers at the same time as the Zagnol so that the Shantoto resolves first and the Zagnol becomes a forward. You can do the opposite with Hilda, to where you play the Hilda, uh, it triggers and Zagnol triggers, and this time you decide to let the Zagnol resolve first so you draw the extra card for the forward. So, it was pretty good. Um, that's my deck. I... Um, I wouldn't run my matchups with you. If you have any questions, let me know. I did play this exact list in the Octagon Open for this round um, yesterday, uh, and I did pretty well. Seven owed my opponent. Um, they were on ice, um, like a like a like an ice Sephiroth control deck with like Lock and Setzer, and so, uh, I guess similar to the deck that you saw in the top eight. Seven owed them. Uh, cards are really hard for them to deal with, like Igis, um, particularly when you're giving it Brave and you have Cleones to stop them from being able to dole it. So, if you want to give spin, feel free. It is a, a little bit of a tough deck to play. Um, it does fold to cards like Sin. Um, it, Estrellas can be kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, Emperor, not so much. I, people, people overestimate how good Emperor is because this isn't the deck with, with uh, Banga Thieves, Green Dragons, Cobodroid Druins, Death Gage, Malboros. You know, this, this really just has Calparina, Gigas, Ozma that you're really trying to activate. You know, Moby's good, but... It's not the center focus of the deck. Um, so the Emperor is not really an issue. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. But yeah, the main issues would definitely be Ishtola um, as probably the most played uh, annoying card, whereas Sen is probably the biggest card that would wreck this deck quite a bit. Um, sure, Psycon uh, Enforcers would be annoying, but they're not the end of the world. I mean, they just kill one guy and... 
you move on, particularly if it's like a Cleone or whether they kill a Schrodinger. Like the best thing they can kill is a Zagnol. Really is not that potent against this deck. Um, however, Estenian can also be a problem. So, you know, if your opponent is playing like Sid Previa and ramping backups to Estenian, that could certainly be an issue that you'd want to watch out for. Um, as far as changes, again, I wouldn't make too many. Um, there are certainly thoughts that you could add or subtract some of these cards, which I've gone over. I think that I've covered all the major changes I could see, um, at least ones that I am going to share, as I am also myself prepping for the Petite Cup Finals um, and the Petite Cup Kansas. I do think that I'm leaning towards this deck for the Petite Cup and uh, away from it for the Finals, obviously, with the Finals being such a small field, it is a much easier time to metagame, um, and it really wouldn't hurt in a field of like eight people for someone to throw a couple sins in their deck. So, this deck is excellent for a surprise tournament or a big open field. It does really good against the majority of the field. But if you play at your locals this week and you have an eight-man locals and you try to play it next week, um, yeah, just be sad when someone shows up with their Sen uh, Istola deck and they're able just to, to beat you down with it. Um, that being said, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I do want to shout out to RVA themselves, um, particular, you know, uh, I never mind, no particulars. All of them are amazing. You know, Chris Adams got us our, our Airbnb, which was amazing and just did so much for us and na was our navigator man really the whole time they were there. Um, Adam had so much influence in how that tournament ran, just did such a good job. It was amazing as always to see Adam, uh, Duncan. Um, I just, I can't say enough good things about the shop, how well it was run, the RVA crew, the RVA podcast. They did such a good job. Um, I am super excited about the Crystal Cup. So I will see you guys there. I'll see you guys in Tampa if you come to Tampa. Um, and if not, hopefully I'll see you guys on March 9th for the Petite Cup. Um, and then hopefully the finals. Hopefully some of you guys make it. Uh, I've been your host, Samson Knight Prime, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye.